Let's pray for a moment. Our Heavenly Father, we first of all thank you for what we have this morning. We thank you most of all for Jesus. Yes. There's nothing in life better than Jesus. We thank you for your salvation. We thank you for your word and for the Holy Spirit that abides with us forever. Yes, we now intercede today for these requests. We have some in our hearts that were not spoken, but you know what they are. And we pray to you now, God, this morning for these requests. We pray for those facing surgery. We pray for testing and making. We pray for all the prayer lists. And we ask him today, God, for a powerful day in your house. Yes, amen. We know you want us to have one. Amen. And it's available today to all of us if we just reach out and receive what you have in store. We thank you, God, again for everything you have done. Bless the work today in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We have today a song the Holy Spirit inspired Moses to write. Moses to write. It's Psalm 90. It's referred to as the prayer of Moses in the wilderness. He would express some things he went through in the wilderness. First of all, is teach us to number our days. Teach us to number our days. We have three things here today in Psalm 90. The first one is the glory of God. Let's read verse 1 and verse 2 of Psalm 90. Lord here means the one who rules. He's sovereign. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Now Numbers list about 42 places they count in those 40 years. Different places. But Moses says, Thou hast been our dwelling place. Even though they had different locations, he considered the Lord at his dwelling place. You have moved around over the years. I've moved around over the years, different places and all of that. But this is still our dwelling place. Doesn't matter where we live, what location we may live in, he's still our dwelling place. In the travels of those 40 years, this is what Moses said. Verse 2, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even for everlasting, everlasting, thou art God. For anything else was made, thou art God. Mm -hmm. In the beginning was God. We can't comprehend that. We go back so far, and we lose our train of thought. In the beginning was God. Verse number, verse number. We'll stop there. The second part, the sorrow of humanity. Now he would change somewhat from the glory of God, talking about that, to the sorrow of humanity in verse 3. And we're going to read through this and talk a little bit about it, okay? Verse 3. Thou turnest men to destruction. It's talking about here to the dust. We were made for the dust. We're going back to the dust, our body. Thou turnest man to, the, to destruction or to the dust and sayest, return you children of men. God returns people again to the dust. Verse four, for a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, when it is past and as a watch in the night. In other words, how God views a thousand years. Verse five, thou carest them away as with a flood. Uh, the years pass by like a flood. They are as asleep. Years of our life as sleep. Quickly we awake. In the morning they are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourishes and groweth up. In the evening it is cut down and withered. Talking about our years on this earth. For we are consumed by thy anger and by thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities between before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy kindness. All the years we have on this earth, he's talking about what goes on in our life as far as we're still not, we're still not perfect by no means. Verse 9, For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as the tale that is told. In other words, after a while they were talking about us, 
years, years ago talking about us, how we were here. Verse 10, the days of our years are three score years and 10 are 70. And if by reason of strength, they be four score or 80 years, yet is their strength, is their strength labor and sorrow, for it's soon, it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So in these verses, he talks about again, the sorrow of humanity. We are, we are blessed in our life, but he doesn't leave out the hardship and the sorrow of life that comes our way. And also the length of our life is sometimes 70, 80 years old by strength. It's a very brief life. When I was a little boy and you was a little child, it seemed like a life was a long, long, long thing, don't it? But now looking back on it, as these years go by, it's almost unbelievable how really short life is. And he brings it out here in these verses. Also now, the instruction of God in verse 12, let's pick up there. So, since he talked about life being so brief and about how things in life happen, he says now in verse 12, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Teach us how to number our days we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. The Bible says redeem, redeem the time. Make the time count. Number our days. Verse 13, return, O Lord, how long? How long will it be? And let it repent thee, repent thee, come in thy service. O oh, satisfy us early with the mercy. We may rejoice and be glad in all our days. Let's go down to verse 17. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. In other words, want the Lord to remain with them during the light on this earth. So, in the first part, he dealt with several things Moses did. You had any comments on the first part this morning? How about how do you look at your life and you are growing up? Growing up? How do you look at your life? You agree how brief it is? How short life is? Even to be 60, 70, 80, or 90 years old, it's still a very brief life. You know, somehow, Brother Damon, we're, it's like I've always said, we're, we're built to live, and it's hard to imagine not being here. I, I think everybody put that. We know we're going to die, but it's hard to imagine that we won't be here one day. And so, I, until you get down and not healthy, then you start really looking at it even more. Mm -hmm. I preached last week one night, heaven, heaven but no hurry. And I said something to them. I said, I'm going to say it for y'all because you probably want to say it. Uh, you want to go to heaven, but not tonight. Mm -hmm. Is that right? That's true. Yeah. And nothing wrong with that, yeah. to have a will to live. I have seen those, you probably have too, know, that, that needed to go today mm -hmm. and want to go today. And sometimes life gets that way physically that we want to go now. Mm -hmm. But overall, this morning, if we had a choice and bust out front, head for heaven, or stay here, it's probably empty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that. Right. Even Christ prayed before he went to the cross, if there be any other way than this, let us cut past it. Right. will be done. Yep. Right. So, uh, we go, we're going to heaven, but I brought my text with what Paul has said himself, it's expedient for you to I be here. Or need them for you to be here. And everybody needs one another. I mean, your family needs you. Your spouse needs you. Our grandkids, you, your, your neighbors, people need one another. And that's why Paul was playing a rock in a hard place. Because he said, it's more needful for you than I remain. And he said these words were the fathers of the gospel. To get the gospel out for them. So, heaven, for I say right now, no hurry. 
Amen. 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 Brother Lee, I think uh, I think he said one to you that that God has always been and he always will be. <clears throat> and our life is like a vapor. So we should spend our time wisely doing the things of God. We we need to we need to get back in the business of doing of witnessing to others because we know what God has done for us. So I think we need to be out telling others about him and how far he has brought us. And it, with that, there's no retirement in doing that. You know, 65 is not it to stop sharing the gospel. Matter of fact, as you get older and have more time, that is to share the gospel with you. Amen. You know. I know we always... When we're talking to someone, I, I try to just myself, I'm always looking for that open door. You know, because I, I don't want to be one of these, you know, just point, you're going to hell, I'm right, you know, this kind of thing. But, but I always look for that open door for something they say that will lead me through the door to witness to them. You know? We had a man Wednesday night, had been out of prison about eight months. He'd been coming uh, the whole week. He had his Bible and he came down front after we had dismissed Wednesday night. The pastor and I was talking. That's when he got a slave. The door was open right then, and we just joined hands with that with that man, and he got saved. And I commented about that God doesn't dismiss; He doesn't dismiss. He could save after we after we dismiss, and uh, but the opportunity was there, and it slipped by us quickly, and we, <coughs> and we didn't grab the opportunity, and we don't grab the opportunity. See, when, when they come by, the second part is abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Psalm 91, as far as we know, we have no idea who the author is except the Holy Spirit. We know it's the Holy Spirit. First of all, the individual plea that's brought out here in Psalm 91 by the author, let's go ahead and read the first eight verses of Psalm 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That's what you and I are doing today. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare or the trap of the fowler and from the north some pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers. Under his wings shall thy trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasted at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh unto thee. Only with thine eye shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. So here, we have a plea the psalmist brings out, but it brings out more than that. And for example, in verse 7, as you and I go through life, you see on our on our side time time and time again as people on our right side and uh, they shall not come to them. It, it shall not bother you. And as we get closer to God and our and our walk with the Lord, what used to bother us stops bothering us. Right. If, as we don't if we don't come to her in God, even as a Christian, the sidelines bother us. They bother us. But now it says you can have a thousand on your right side, on your side of the fall, and ten thousand on your right hand, but it shall not come nigh to thee. In other words, what they're trying to do as far as destruction won't come to you. You just have a way of, through maturity, not accepting what the crowd has to say. And the crowd is talking. The crowd is loud. And we have what we refer to as the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. But maturity, thank God, helps us to tune the world out and listen to God only. And it's wonderful to live that kind of life. Now he brings out the corporate plea here in verse number nine. Let's pick up there. Because thou hast made the Lord, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. And we have to make him that. Now he is that, but we have to make him that. We have to make him our habitation. We have to allow him to be our habitation. Verse 10, There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over thee 
to keep thee in all thy ways. Now, does bad things happen to good people? Yes, they do. But he brings out here again, we have an advantage in our life as a Christian because of what some receive as plagues, we don't. We don't. And when the things come to our life, bad things to good people or save people, there's still a habitation that we have that other people do not have. When death comes to us as a Christian family, we have the comforter and we have the assurance in our life that those that's lost don't have. So we are actually here in this place he's talking about, again, having him as our habitation because he gives angels charge over them. We have no idea this past week, matter of fact, if an angel stepped in our behalf or not. We don't know that. Probably he did. Probably the angel has, at least the last, at least this year, has come into our place of protection. You know, we call it a close call here, a close call there, or whatever, as being lucky. I'm convinced angels are here, and not if I Hebrew says that. Even to entertain a stranger underwear, we could be entertaining an angel, see, instead of a stranger. So the Bible does speak of that. And uh, in your life, you might have experienced an angel. You didn't even know it. You didn't even know it. But we have all of that because he is our habitation. But look at the divine response in verse 14. Because, because he has set his love upon me, the psalmist says, therefore will I deliver him. I will set, I'm sorry, this is the divine response from God. God is speaking here to the psalmist. Because he has set his love upon me, God says, therefore will I deliver him. See, when he set his love upon, upon God, he's keeping the first and great commandment, which is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He said, once you do that, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he had known my name. And deliverance in our life can take place and still be in the situation. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Amen. You can have deliverance of something and still be in it, but you deliver from it. You have a crisis going on in your life and deliver from it, and you still got a crisis. Does that make, make any sense? Yeah, it just doesn't affect you like it would if you didn't have oh. Yeah. All of a sudden, this thing is still the same, but the effect on it is not the same toward us. We have deliverance in it. That's like forgiving somebody, even though they don't forgive you. That's right. Don't affect you no more. But That's right. You've done your part. You've done your part. I think that just embraces the fact that we are, as Christians, to become more of the spiritual self than the fleshly self, because the spirit can rise above and that's what we're to nurture. Uh-huh. And see, we're not careful in these situations because the thing is still there. The devil convinced us, or his helpers convinced us, well, you prayed didn't work. I said, I guess you didn't because they had changed. And that way we lose the blessing of it. We lose the blessing of it. So he's usually saying, too, it happens sometimes, but he'll go over it. It happened to us, but we don't know why all these things happen. Mm -hmm. But he knows what's going on. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's where it's going. Mm -hmm. All things work together for good. Then that love God and his purpose. Mm -hmm. Everything. Mm -hmm. Somebody say something over here. So would you associate this with oppression? If, if the devil is working his best, and we know what happens to untold millions of people every day, that the devil's got hold of and he does not want you, he, first of all, he does not want you to open this, this word up. And when you do, it just sometimes feels like, um, not that I ever feel like the Lord's not there, but there are times when I can feel uh, something that's not right, like, like not being able to look at these precious words and know what the Lord is trying to tell me until I just stop 
and talk to the Lord and then get all of that off my chest. And then I could go back into the Word. So I think that, like you said, if, if we see angels. If we could see the angels, we would never, ever believe that there could be that many angels flying around to protect the believers. But there are just as many, if not more, flying around to, to destroy the believer. <clears throat> which tells me that we just have to put our trust in God and know that he's going to take care of us. Look at the verse 15. God says here to the psalmist, He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I mean, think about that. It may not be yes, but a note from God is good as yes. It's the right answer. I will be with him in trouble. That's what he said to the psalmist. It says to us, I will deliver him. That's what he says he'll do. And honor him. So 15, all in promise that we have from God. Verse 16, with long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. And I want to share with you what I believe about long life here. But you see, I know somebody that died at 50, 40, 30, whatever. This long life here, life to come after this, life is over. That's the long life. The long life that we have, again, is salvation. And the long life we have never ends. Don't look at this as somebody died at 15 years old and God said, long life I'm satisfied, and said, that young man walked with God. That's not what it's talking about. Life to come after this life is over, including our saved years now, is a long life. It's not just saying, in the old years, I thought about that. Some Lord, I, somebody I know died at 60 years old, and whatever. That's not what it's talking about. But a long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. And salvation starts a, starts a long life. You got, you got right now inside eternal life already. It won't start when you draw your last breath. It's already started. Eternal life's already started. When you pray the sinner's prayer and Christ become your Lord and Savior, your long life started then. When would it end? Never, Whenever we never, end. Never. Because what's called it is eternal life. Never. Eternal life. Okay. The third part, and the final part, it is good to give thanks, Psalm 92. And uh, praise and thanksgiving again in Psalm in verse 1. It is a good thing to give thanks. I think every day if we get a list of thanksgiving, it rule out a lot of stuff in our life. It's a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. And his same praises unto thy name, O Most High. The song service Thursday night contributed to a revival of spirits. Sing praises unto thy name. Brother David and the George started singing the goodness of God and the refuse ladies knew every word. They drowned y'all out. They did. And on the other side, I had, we had another group from another yep. uh, facility of ladies. And they shouted the whole night. And the refuse in the middle to come out of hell, they shouted the whole night. And all the rest of us, we said that primarily. You know, why is it that people that's coming out of hell get so excited and we don't? And Brother David, that evening, um, I really saw uh, a scripture fulfilled in the sense that I, I wished I, I had looked it up since then but I haven't I, I will this afternoon there is a scripture that it's it speaks of um, forming our nature the per performing actually performing like God performing like Jesus and um, uh, I've used this in sharing with other people sometimes that when we go sing it's not for entertainment but it is that we perform because we we practice, we make as perfect as we can what we're doing. And we think about how maybe God can use us to say something that might encourage someone. So all that is an act of uh, preparation and practice 
and then when you get through with your practice, then you perform it out. And um, that evening, I had opportunity to speak to every one of those ladies there in the first stage of uh, the refuge. And one was there fixing to graduate, but another one was there, bless her heart, she was 19 years old and was going to only have been there a week the next day. And I watched her and she watched everything that the others were doing. She was learning and through their performance, how to be new. Mm -hmm. It was beautiful. It was, it always is. Look at verse two. To show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night, every night, every morning, upon an instrument of ten strings, upon the psaltery, upon the harp, with a solemn sound, talking about music again, back in verse one, praises unto the Lord, using these instruments. For thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the works of thy hands. We'll go wrong sometimes with praises and even instruments and all this. We try to work it up ourselves. That's right. And, <clears throat> and God doesn't need any help. That doesn't count. If we try to ourselves, work it up ourselves, it becomes superficial. It has to be what God is doing. At the same time, we can't just sit there and be a spectator. We have to receive the move of God. <clears throat> We're not supposed to work it up, but we're also supposed to receive it and act on what God is doing. Either way, who gets in the way of it? My flesh does. Either way. So he's speaking up here, praising Thanksgiving this morning, and we all can praise God today, all of us in this room, for a lot of things that God has blessed us with this week. Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving. But the problem is the week in verse 6, pick up there please, a brutish man, a brutish man here who acts like an animal, knoweth not. Not about the praises, not about the instruments, nothing. Not about giving thanksgiving, nothing. Neither doth a fool understand this. Understand what? Praise and worship. A fool doesn't understand praise and worship. Many of them uh, are against praise and worship. They don't want it. They say you should be reverent. It wasn't reverence, man. Right. You need to be reverent in the Lord's house. Verse 7. When the wicked, when the wicked spring as the grass, when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. That's their outcome they're going to have. But thou, Lord, art most high forevermore. Doesn't matter what the brutish do. And what they try to defeat us with or destroy us. Keep in mind, verse 8, the Lord are most high forever. Then verse 9, below thy enemies, O Lord, below thy enemies shall perish, all of them. All the works of iniquity shall be scattered, all of them. But thou, o Lord, art most high forevermore. And we need to keep that in our thought all the time. Verse number 8. No matter what's going on, what the enemies are trying to do, what they're trying to accomplish, Lord God, most high forevermore. That's our Lord. And now I'm going to go down to verse uh, 10 on the last part. Promise the righteous, that's you and I too, verse 10. But my horn, the horn here it means power. But my power shall thou exalt like the horn or the power of a unicorn. Now, a unicorn back in those days was similar to a horse, but it had one single horn. It was a real animal, something like an ox, but it had one single horn. Now, the psalmist here says, Thy power shall exalt like the horn of a unicorn. Powerful, powerful, powerful animal with this horn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Mine eye also shall see my desire on mine enemies. And my ears shall hear my desire of the wicked that rise up against me. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like the cedar. And cedar now in Lebanon was a massive and strong tree. So the psalmist compares now his growing to be massive and strong like a tree in, Le in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the course of our God. 
They shall bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. To show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Now, uh, in Psalm 92, what did I miss the Sabbath day in? Oh, yeah. You have in your Bible on the Psalm 92 a song from the Sabbath day? You don't have anything like that in your Bible? Yeah, I do. Okay. I want to today, Brother Dave, if you don't mind, I want to today clear up to us about the Sabbath day. Now, you know what it is. You've been in Bible study. It's Saturday. And, but sometimes, you know, I used to be a billboard down close to Macon about the Sabbath day, and the billboard actually said, if you didn't honor the Sabbath day, you're going to hell. Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to see again the Sabbath day for us today. Brother David, uh, Exodus 31, verse 16 and 17. Exodus 31, verse 16 and 17. Okay, here we go. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, children of Israel, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for perpetual or ongoing covenant. Okay? It's a sign between me and the children of Israel three times now, forever. In the sixth day the Lord made heaven and earth. On the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. It is a sign it is a sign between me and the children of Israel. New Testament, ever since the crucifixion, resurrection rather, the church has met on the first day of the week, not on Saturday. Now, those who meet on Saturday, if they're saved, they're going to heaven. There ain't no problem. I'm not saying they're lost, by no means. But, some of them, not all of them, but some try to put us in a bondage saying, y'all going the wrong day. And since the resurrection, we had met on the Lord's day. On the Lord's day. And Sunday referred to as the Lord's day. But scripturally, because we had a couple years years ago, a young couple got saved. They were so happy. I mean, they couldn't get enough, God. And Armstrong out of Columbus, Ted W. Armstrong and something like that. Armstrong. He was a Sabbath day Adventist uh, law letter killing man. And they began to listen to him and they quit coming to church. So I went to see him one night and uh, and I, I shared these verses right here. And I said, I'll tell you what, let's lay aside verses. A few months ago, y'all were on fire for God. Y'all were happy. Y'all were laughing. Y'all were praising God. And now y'all sit up here like two statues. You don't have a smile on your face. Common sense take you something out. You ain't a bondage. You ain't a bondage to say. You have let Saturday take over your life. And you're under bondage. For all of us, we need to mark that down. Everybody ever asked you why you didn't be on? Why you not make no Saturday is because the Sabbath day was between God and Israel alone. It was for them on the, on the Sabbath day. And Christ honored Sabbath day. He went to synagogue. Paul went to synagogues. They honored it. But since the resurrection, matter of fact, Paul said, bring your offering in on the first day of the week. It's just been a custom since the resurrection to celebrate the resurrection on the first day of the week. And see, Sunday's not the last day, it's the first day of the week. It's the day's the first day of the week. And God's always demanded the first. Jericho, the first city, he said, that's my city. God wants the first proofs of everything. So the first day of the week is the Lord's day. It's the Lord's day. Mm -hmm. Brother Kirk? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I used to work uh, in my early years. I worked for Seventh day at Genesis. And we had a lot of very interesting, sometimes heated conversations. But through the years, I have found that um, different denominations, people of uh, different beliefs, they tend to begin boasting in one thing. I worship on this day. I believe this doctrine. And it all comes down to me. I find that as uh, offensive because we're boasting in one thing 
and one thing only. So if a person calls himself a believer of another denomination, and they're always going to a particular thing, a particular thing, and a particular thing, and it's not Christ, yes. I automatically say that there's something wrong in their life. If he's not first, then where is he at? Amen. So bringing up, even us, bringing up Sunday all the time, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. It's the same thing what they could do. It's sad, it's sad, it's sad. Well, we can get hung up on what's saved, always saved. We can get hung up on anything. Anything. But if it's not Christ. Right. I preached in free will church one night, free will, and they believe you have a free will to, to lead Christ. And I told them, I said, look, we got a major doctrine difference between what I have and what you have. Tonight, let's just preach Jesus. That's what I do. Just preach Jesus. That's right. You know, just preach Jesus. Because... If they got slave, they slave. No matter what they think, they still say. You know, they got slave, they say, right? Amen. And they just confused about being lost again. Yeah. But that's not the issue. Getting slave is the issue. You know, that's, that's, that's the main issue. Anything else to that? I think Paul cleared it up when he said, All things are lost for me. Yes. But certain things I won't do. That's right. God wants to That's right. All things are lost This church last week, the first. Congregation Christian Church. I don't know what it all means, but we have revival then. Yeah. I don't know what the title of all means. We have revival. Yeah. We have revival. God saved. Amen. Anything else? All right then.